It was the evening of November 23rd, 1953. The winter darkness had just settled over Michigan. At an isolated radar station, air defense operators monitored the surrounding airspace. Suddenly, a blip appeared on the radar screen. The unknown aircraft was flying above Lake Superior, not far from the Sioux Locks, located in the St. Mary's River between the United States and Canada. This was a heavily guarded and restricted airspace. No aircraft were scheduled to be flying in the area. It was necessary to identify whatever it was as soon as humanly possible. In less than two minutes, an F-89 was dispatched from nearby Kinross Air Force Base, streaking toward the locks. At the jet's controls were Lieutenant Felix Moncla Jr., a 27-year-old member of the United States Air Force who had clocked 811 flying hours, including 121 in a similar aircraft. Second Lieutenant Robert Wilson sat behind him, observing radar. Guided by ground control, Moncla climbed steeply toward the unknown aircraft. Back on the ground, the controller watched the jet's blip on his radar. As Moncla approached the unidentified blip, it changed course. The controller called Moncla and gave him the new bearing. The object was headed toward Lake Superior. At over 500 miles per hour, the F-89 raced after it out across Whitefish Bay. The minutes ticked by in the tense ground control radar room. Gradually, the F-89 closed the gap. By now, the controller knew that 2nd Lieutenant Wilson should have spotted the object on the fighter jet's short-range radar. Watching the chase, he cut in his microphone and called the flight's code name. Target should be visual. Still bearing... The controller... stopped himself, mid-sentence. According to the radar screen, Moncla had approached the unidentified blip and it appeared that the two blips had somehow merged into one. The two machines appeared to be locked together as if there had been a collision. For a moment longer, the huge, ominous blip remained on the glass before continuing on its path, quickly disappearing from the radar screen. The controller marked the last known position of Moncla's jet before contacting search and rescue teams. If the jet had encountered an emergency, Moncla and Wilson might have bailed out in time as they each were equipped with life vests and self-inflating rafts. Search planes were almost immediately cutting across the sky over Lake Superior. They searched all night, canvassing over 100 square miles of water. No trace was ever found of the men, the F-89, or the strange object. Now again, just to be clear, you don't have to watch any of these in any particular order, so don't worry if you haven't seen the first one. That being said, we're picking right back up from where we left off on Layer 3 with The Disappearance of Felix Moncla. A man who vanished from the sky in November of 1953 over Lake Superior, along with 2nd Lieutenant Robert L. Wilson. Now, things get a little murky during the investigation. Originally, the United States Air Force went with the same line of events we discussed earlier, which is the same as what those involved report happening. However, sometime later, they backtracked on this line of events, stating that the unidentified object had actually been a Canadian C-47 jet that had somehow flown off course by around 30 miles, which is quite a distance, especially when considering how restricted the surrounding airspace was between the two countries. The Royal Canadian Air Force disputed this claim from the United States, stating that they have no information on the supposed C-47 flight or the intercept. To date, there is no indication of what the object was or why Moncla's plane vanished when the two flight paths intersected. Miracle of the Sun 
The Miracle of the Sun was a series of events reported to have occurred miraculously on the 13th of October, 1917. Attended by a large crowd who had gathered in Fatima, Portugal in response to a prophecy made by three shepherd children. Beginning in the spring of 1916, the three Catholic shepherd children reported apparitions of an angel, and starting in May 1917, apparitions of the Virgin Mary, whom the children described as the Lady of the Rosary. The children reported a prophecy that prayer would lead to an end of the Great War, or World War I, as it would later be referred to. And that on the 13th of October of that year, the lady would reveal her identity and perform a miracle, quote, so that all may believe. Newspapers reported the prophecies, and large groups of pilgrims began visiting the area. When finally the 13th of October rolled around, something happened. There were reports of extraordinary solar activity, such as the sun appearing to dance or zigzag in the sky, careen towards the earth, or emit multicolored light in radiant colors. According to these reports, the event lasted approximately 10 minutes. Here are just a few accounts of what was seen in the sky that day. The sun at one moment surrounded with scarlet flame, at another surrounded in yellow and deep purple seemed to be in an exceedingly swift and whirling movement at times appearing to be loosened from the sky and to be approaching the earth, strongly radiating heat. The silver sun, enveloped in the same gauzy gray light, was seen to whirl and turn in a circle of broken clouds. The light turned a beautiful blue as if it had come through the stained glass windows of a cathedral and spread itself over the people who knelt with outstretched hands. People wept and prayed with uncovered heads in the presence of a miracle they had awaited. The seconds seemed like hours, so vivid were they. The sun, whirling, seemed to loosen itself from the firmament and advance threateningly upon the earth as if to crush us with its huge fiery weight. The sensation during those moments was terrible. I feel incapable of describing what I saw. I looked fixedly at the sun, which seemed pale and did not hurt my eyes. Looking like a ball of snow revolving on itself, it suddenly seemed to come down in a zigzag, menacing the earth. Terrified, I ran and hid myself among the people who were weeping and expecting the end of the world at any moment. This is such a fascinating event to me. Whether or not you believe that there was some supernatural cause to this, you have to admit that something very strange happened that day. I mean, just taking a look at some of the photos from that day, you can see that there were clearly tens of thousands of people all gathered, transfixed by something strange that was happening with the sun. It's also very interesting how similar all the different details from the eyewitness accounts are. There are literally tens of thousands of accounts still in existence to this day, many of them claiming the same sights, including that the sun was zigzagging around in the sky, that it was changing colors, and even that it was growing in size or approaching the earth. Now, obviously there's no way that the sun was actually doing all that stuff. It clearly would have been recorded from other locations on the planet. But with that in mind, again, what could cause literally tens of thousands of people to see the same thing? There have been many different explanations thrown out through the years since this happened, but none of them honestly cover all the bases and explain all the different things that were seen. People were literally running and jumping behind rocks, fearing the end of the world. So, what did they see? The Cash Landrum Incident on the evening of December 29, 1980, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's seven-year-old grandson, Colby Landrum, were driving home to Dayton, Texas in Cash's Oldsmobile Cutlass after eating out at a restaurant. They later said that at about 9 o'clock p.m. while driving on an isolated road in the middle of the woods, they saw a light above some trees and that they first thought it was an airplane approaching a nearby airport and gave it little notice. A few moments later, on the winding roads, they state that they observed the same light as before, now much closer and brighter. 
They said that it came from a huge diamond-shaped object which hovered at about the treetop level, and that its base was expelling a flame and emitting significant heat. Landrum told Cash to stop the car, fearing that they would be burned if they got closer. Cash said she was nervous and contemplated turning around and escaping back in the direction they had come, but abandoned this idea as the road was too narrow and she presumed the car would get stuck on the dirt shoulders which were soft from rainfall earlier that evening. Cash and Landrum both got out of the car to examine the object, but Landrum quickly returned to the car as Colby was terrified and had begun crying. Cash remained outside, quote, mesmerized by the bizarre sight. They said the heat was strong enough to make the car's metal body painful to the touch. Cash said she had to use her coat to protect her hand from being burned by the door handle when she finally got back to the car. Landrum would lean her hand onto the vinyl dashboard of the car, which had been heated up to such a degree that it had become softened and malleable, leaving a handprint that was evident weeks later. Something investigators would struggle to explain and cite as proof of their experience. They said that the object then ascended over the treetops and rose higher into the sky before a group of Chinooks approached it, surrounding it in tight formation. With the road now clear, Cash says that they then drove on, fleeing the scene. From first sighting the object to its departure, they said that the encounter lasted about 20 minutes. Cash took the Landrums home, then retired for the evening. That night, they all experienced similar symptoms, with Cash being the most heavily afflicted. They suffered from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized weakness, a burning sensation in their eyes, and feeling as though they were suffering from sunburn. Over the next few days, Cash's symptoms worsened, with many large, painful blisters forming on her skin. When taken to a hospital emergency room on January 3rd, 1981, Cash had become unable to walk and had even begun to lose large patches of skin and hair. She was released from the hospital after 12 days, though her condition had not significantly improved. She later would return to the hospital for another two weeks. The Landrum's health was somewhat better, though reportedly both suffered from lingering weakness, skin sores, and hair loss. Cash later reportedly developed breast cancer and Landrum severe cataracts. On the 25th of January, 1996, Brian A. McClelland, MD, went on record stating that she had a clear history of radiation exposure with post-radiation hair loss, skin damage, and GI symptoms. Another radiologist who examined the witness's medical records stated that, quote, We have strong evidence that these patients have suffered secondary damage to ionizing radiation. On the 28th of November, 1981, Cash was diagnosed with pericarditis, inflammation of the heart sac. Her physician remarked that her condition was likely, quote, secondary to radiation exposure. Eighteen years to the day following her close encounter and subsequent multiple surgeries, Betty Cash succumbed to her ailments. Now, of course, with any case of strange objects flying around in the sky, we're going to have to be very skeptical. Now, while there isn't a vast amount of evidence for this case, the majority of what we do have are their injuries. Cash's medical records seem to indicate that she was exposed to a very large amount of radiation in a very short period of time. This apparently led her and the Landrums to develop sores all over their bodies, among other ailments. I think something of note is the fact that Landrum returned back to the car fairly quickly to comfort Colby, who was obviously terrified. Perhaps the reason why Betty Cash experienced much more serious symptoms is because she was outside and exposed to whatever this was for much longer. The Huang Yan Shu Incident We're definitely starting to enter into more obscure territory now, so if you have any additional information on this story, be sure to leave it in the comments because I was really only able to find several articles on this incident. 
Huan Yang Shu was born in 1956 in Dongbaigou village in China's Hebei province. Little is known about his early life aside from the fact that he worked as a farmer in the village and his mother passed away while he was a child. On July 27, 1977, Huan was 21 years old and still working as a farmer. At 10 o'clock p.m., Huang had just finished his farm work for the day and went to bed in his unfinished home. The following morning, Huang was nowhere to be found. The village was alarmed and puzzled by Huang's disappearance, sparking a large search effort to try and find him. However, their efforts yielded no results. They searched the surrounding roads, ponds, cliffs, and other areas to try and locate him, even contacting surrounding hospitals and authorities in search of more information, to no avail. Over a week later, on the 6th of August, the village committee received a telegram from Shanghai, which was located some 540 miles from the village. The telegram stated that Huang was being held at a deportation center and that they were hoping for a local to come and return him back home. Now, here's where things get very strange. The telegram had actually been late to arrive as it was accidentally addressed to the wrong village. The telegram had been dated 9 o'clock a.m. on July 28th, less than half a day after his disappearance. Surely this couldn't be the same man, right? Huang was later returned by the police in Shanghai, and it was indeed him. Huang was questioned by his fellow villagers, and he could not provide a solid answer. According to him, he simply retired for the night, fell asleep, and was suddenly awoken at around 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning by the sounds of vehicles and people. After coming to his senses, he found himself on a sidewalk, surrounded by cars, neon lights, and skyscrapers. He wandered around and quickly realized that he was somehow in the city of Nanjing, 485 miles away from his home village. Huang was quickly approached by two police officers. When they asked Huang what he was doing and who he was, he simply said that he was really lost. The officers then took Huang to the Nanjing Rail Station where he was sent to a Shanghai reparation camp for migrants and those without a Hukou document. Huang, not exactly being in a position to resist the police officers, boarded the four-hour train ride to Shanghai. Immediately after stepping off into Shanghai, Huang headed for the first police station he could find, and, to his confusion, the exact same police officers from Nanjing were already waiting for him. The fact that the train would have certainly been the fastest possible method of travel, as well as the fact that they had definitely not boarded the train with him, meant that their presence should have been impossible. The two officers dropped Huang off at the camp in Shanghai. The police erroneously addressed the telegram from earlier to the wrong village, only for it to be correctly forwarded to his home several days later. While in the camp, he met a soldier named Lu Quintang, who he relayed his story to. Take note of this soldier, as he'll be coming up again later. He would be returned to his village in a matter of days. Now, in regard to the night of his disappearance, it would have been impossible for him to have traveled to Ninjang by train in such a short amount of time, as the nearest station was located 20 miles away, and he had never even been there before, not to mention the fact that he wouldn't have even had the money to board the train. Even if he had somehow boarded this train, it would have taken over a full day to reach the city of Nanjing when... Huang somehow appeared there within around nine hours. It is also of note that leaving their ancestral village and families was heavily frowned upon. 
The villagers, left confused and without answers, were forced to move past the incident. That is, until September 8th, 1977. It was harvest season in the village again, and Huang and his fellow villagers were made to do backbreaking work. At 10 o'clock p.m., the head of the village gave Huang and a few other villagers permission to leave and go to bed early, as long as they send and deliver fertilizer the next morning. They all took this offer and retired for the night. The next morning, on September 9th, the villagers arrived at the fertilizer storage area, only to find Huang absent. Thinking that he had overslept, they all went to his house, only to find it completely empty. Huang somehow found himself back in Shanghai. However, this time, there would be witnesses both in Shanghai and in the village of Dongbaizhou. A majority of the village witnessed Huang go to his house and sleep before he would apparently just vanish. As with his first disappearance, Huang couldn't explain it. According to him, this time he woke up at the Shanghai rail station due to a cold breeze. As Huang began to walk, he heard a voice coming from behind him. When he turned around, he saw two men dressed in military uniforms. They told Huang that they were soldiers and were assigned to pick him up from the railway station and bring him to Lu Quintang. That same soldier from the camp the police had brought him to the last time this happened. The two men dropped Huang off at Lu's home, which was located in this artillery division on a Chinese military base. Lu's wife, Li Yuying, was surprised that the three men were able to gain access to the base. Years later, Lu's son, when questioned about the case, would go on record to say that the two soldiers' uniforms looked off and, quote, not very fitting, especially their visors. One's shoes and visor are the most important part of the uniform. These two uniforms seem to have been borrowed. Without any other information, the authorities decided to send Huang back to the village, but sternly warned him that he'd be arrested if they ever saw him again. He returned home on the 11th of September. Due to the multitude of witnesses testifying that Huang went to sleep in the village and the military confirming that he was in Shanghai, there was simply no denying that something extremely bizarre was occurring. Huang became the most talked about resident of the village. Rumors and superstitions quickly spread about Huang, with many suspecting that he had been possessed or haunted. The constant attention took a mental toll on Huang's fiance, who eventually sued his family for 200 won due to reputational damages, and divorced him. This financially and emotionally ruined Huang. It was then, when he was at his lowest, that the third and final incident happened. Huang continued working as a farmer and laborer until September 20th, 1977. After he had finished his work for the day and began walking home, he stated that he had become so exhausted that he ended up simply passing out in the yard in front of his house he wouldn't be seen for over a week. On September 28th, over a week after his third disappearance, he was found under a jujube tree in the village. When asked where he had been, he told the most extraordinary story yet. Now, I just feel the need to butt in here for a quick second. As if this story wasn't already super confusing, this next part is just insane. I want to reassure you guys that this is not a work of fiction, and there's really no explanation behind how this man was able to travel such vast distances in such a short period of time. So just buckle up for this next part. Um, we're going to reconvene later, obviously, and discuss what might have happened here. According to him, after he passed out in front of his home, he woke up in a luxury hotel room. 
He looked around, and behind him, he saw the same two men from the first two incidents. This time, however, they were both dressed in civilian clothing and introduced themselves. They told Huang that they were brothers from Shangdong province and identified themselves as Gao Dengmin, 26, and Gao Yanjin, 25. They told Huang that they were the cause behind his disappearances and that they dressed as police officers and soldiers to help him find his way home. They said that they had something special planned for Huang and that during the next several days, they would take him to nine major cities. Huang asked where he was at that moment, and the brothers told him that he was in the city of Lanzhou, the furthest he had ever been from home. Soon, Huang would apparently learn how he had traveled so far, so quickly. The following day, on September 21st, they made Huang climb onto their backs, and as Huang would later state, they took off and seemed to literally fly away with just their bodies. Huang said that they were flying at a low altitude and that he didn't feel any wind. He also recounted that the brothers took turns carrying him on their backs. In over an hour, the three had arrived in Beijing. They first went to the Shang'an Grand Theater without tickets, and just like at the army base, nobody stopped them, and they watched an opera performance. Their next stop was Tiananmen Square. That same day, they then flew to Tianjin, where they snuck into a movie theater without tickets and watched a movie. On September 22nd, they arrived in Harbin, where they apparently visited a department store. This, according to Huang, would continue over the course of nine days and across nine different cities before he remembers going to sleep after returning to that same luxury hotel room and waking up under the tree mentioned earlier back in his home village. When Huang asked why they singled him out, they wouldn't respond. When he asked if they could teach him how to fly like them or tell them how they learned to do it, they would simply give a firm no. Eventually, the local police, propaganda department, and the nearest military base had heard of Huang's story and began a very extensive investigation. While being interrogated, his behavior was found to be normal and he showed no signs of mental illness or cognitive disorders. There was rather conclusive evidence of Huang's first two incidents as numerous witnesses as well as official telegrams all confirm that Huang had gone to sleep in his home village, only to appear in Shanghai, but there was far more doubt as to whether or not he had been to any of the cities mentioned during his third disappearance. So, approaching this from a logical perspective, what the hell happened here? One theory that appears to make sense initially is the idea that he may actually have multiple personality disorder and it's possible that these two men that he saw were just figments of his imagination. Perhaps the personalities of the two brothers take over when they're traveling, and when they get there, Huang comes back in. Although this theory seems to make sense initially, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny as multiple mental health officials have examined Huang and found him completely sane. He appears to be a normal, quiet person of sound mind, and it's very unlikely that he wouldn't have displayed this condition before or after these events occurred. This theory also doesn't explain the short travel times, which are literally backed up by multiple witnesses. As well as the fact that Lu's wife and son both saw Huang standing with the two soldiers in their home. To date, it's unclear how Huang was able to travel such vast distances in such short amounts of time, who these two men were, and overall, what happened here. Victor Goddard's Iced Plain Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard was a senior commander in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. He claimed to have witnessed the clairvoyant experience of another officer in China during January 1946. Goddard was at a party in Shanghai and scheduled to fly to Tokyo that same night when he heard of another officer having a dream in which Goddard was killed in a plane crash. 
In the dream, an aircraft was carrying Goddard, two other men, and a woman when it experienced difficulties with atmospheric icing and crashed on a pebbled beach near some mountains. That night, Goddard was persuaded to take two men and a woman on the Douglas Dakota on a flight to Tokyo. As in the other officer's dream, the Dakota plane iced over and was forced to make a crash landing on the Japanese island of Sado. The crash scene, a pebbled beach near mountains, resembled exactly what had been described in the dream. Luckily, however, unlike the dream, everyone survived and nobody had been injured. Now, the only real logical theory here is that it was all just a coincidence, right? But what a coincidence that would have to be. I mean, this guy literally predicted, first of all, the fact that the plane would go down. He also predicted the cause of the plane going down. He predicted who would be on the plane and where it would even happen. Logan Schindelman's Disappearance Logan Schindelman, born June 27, 1996, was raised in Tumwater, Washington by his maternal grandmother, Virginia Jebo. Logan had previously attended Tumwater High School where he was a star defensive back on the school's football team. After graduating high school in 2015, Schindelman enrolled at Washington State University around 300 miles away for one year before dropping out and moving back in with his grandmother and half-sister. On the morning of May 19th, 2016, Logan spoke with his grandmother while the two prepared for their respective jobs. His grandmother stated that, quote, he was just really nervous, which he isn't usually, kind of on a mission. She also stated that he claimed to have had an epiphany. His grandmother told Logan that they would have to continue their conversation later before she left for work. However, Logan wouldn't return home that night. After a considerable amount of time had passed without Logan coming home that evening, his grandmother tracked his cell phone and saw that it had pinged near Olympia, where his mother lived. She reasonably assumed he was just visiting her. The following day, when Logan still hadn't returned home, his grandmother attempted to report him missing, but found the county police department to be closed for the weekend. This forced Logan's grandmother to wait until Monday, May 23rd, four days after Logan's disappearance, to actually report him missing. After filing the report, she was informed that Logan's car, a black 1996 Chrysler Sebring, had been impounded several days earlier on Friday the 20th. The vehicle was found parked at milepost 92 alongside southbound Interstate 5. His personal items, including his cell phone, wallet, and several bags of food, were all found inside his car. Shortly after Logan's disappearance, several witnesses came forward to Thurston County Police, stating that they had witnessed Schindelman's vehicle on Interstate 5 the morning of May 20th. One woman driving on the interstate that morning reported seeing Logan with two men standing at the back of his car, which was parked on the right shoulder of the interstate near exit 95. The woman stated that upon driving home later that evening, she saw the car still parked in the same spot, seemingly abandoned with the hood open. Around 2 o'clock p.m. on May 20th, three individuals called 911 to report a car matching Logan's Chrysler Sebring drifting across the lanes of Interstate 5 near the milepost where Schindelman's car had been discovered. They stated that they had witnessed the car veering across three lanes toward the center divider before hitting the concrete barrier and coming to a complete stop. Strangely, no one appeared to be driving the car. A truck driver passing by reported seeing a Caucasian man with brown or red hair jumping out of the vehicle's passenger side and running into the woods on the side of the interstate. Later in the evening of May 20th, there was a potential sighting of a naked teenager in the area, though the identity of the individual is unknown. Thurston County Detective Frank Frawley stated that, quote, We thought that might have been Logan, and so they did initiate a search using dogs. They didn't locate anything. 
Could have been Logan. Could have been anybody. The last clothing Logan was known to be wearing included a black windbreaker, a white shirt, jeans, and possibly a pair of Nike tennis shoes. Logan's uncle, Mike Ware, a retired Thurston County Sheriff, assisted in organizing search efforts for his nephew. A search was conducted in a two-mile radius surrounding the interstate where the car had been found, specifically in the surrounding woods. The team searched both on foot and by air, but no evidence of Logan was found. In June of that year, Ware stated that, quote, The area is extremely thick and brushy. I've spent hours out there searching myself. Canines were brought into search, and it's been covered extensively, but nothing has been found. Logan's family, backed into a corner with no other options, hired a private investigator to search for him, but noted that little information was present, making the search difficult. Using cell phone records, law enforcement were able to track Schindelman's movements on the morning of Friday, May 20th, which showed he had traveled towards Interstate 5 heading south. He then turned around and headed north before reversing direction again, heading south on Interstate 5, and eventually stopping where his vehicle was recovered. Now, it's obviously difficult to draw any definitive conclusions as to what happened here, but there still is something that I need to touch on, and that is Logan's mental health. Now, Logan's grandmother, Virginia, actually stated that he had been going through a sort of identity crisis in high school. She also stated that he started smoking marijuana in college, which, while that's not inherently a cause of, like, mental health problems, she stated that she believes it sparked a sort of paranoia in him. He started to believe that somebody was watching him through his bedroom window, or even that somebody might be following him. His family also noticed that he had been more withdrawn since returning from college. Logan had seemingly cut ties with many of his friends from high school when he started attending Washington State University, and sadly, it seems that he may have been unable to rekindle new friendships while he was there. After his grades slipped, he returned back home and began working around town doing odd jobs, but seemed to keep largely to himself. There's also discussion that Logan felt disconnected from the African-American side of his family. However, shortly before his disappearance, he reached out to his maternal side of his family and seems to have had a sort of emotional meeting with them. He was shown pictures of his grandfather and uncle from that side of the family and is quoted as saying, it feels good to see somebody who looks like me. Some speculate that these factors came together to form some sort of a mental health crisis, but that still leaves so many questions. Who were the men he was seen standing with on the side of the road, and who jumped out of his passenger side door and into the woods? Obviously, there's not enough information to draw any conclusions. The L-8 Blimp One August Sunday morning in 1942, a lone bather on a San Francisco beach, several miles south of the Golden Gate Bridge, noticed something... strange in the sky. Approaching the coast at an extremely low altitude was... a Navy blimp. The observer watched as the 147-foot-long aircraft sluggishly bounced off the beach and rose briefly into the air before crashing into a nearby hill. The blimp's propellers were severely damaged in the collision, and one of its 325-pound depth charges were dislodged, rolling down the hill. After losing this considerable amount of weight, the now sagging V-shaped blimp drifted back up into the sky, continuing towards the city of San Francisco. Hundreds of people began chasing down the blimp, enchanted by the strange events unfolding. After some time drifting east, the airship eventually began to lose elevation. It started slamming into roofs and snapping through telephone lines. Nearby, a man stood in the street, waxing his 1928 Dodge sedan. Suddenly, noticing the out-of-control blimp, the man fled before the enormous airship descended, landing partially on top of his car.
Despite the surrounding chaos, the blimp had actually touched down fairly gently, and its crew members were assumed to have been unharmed inside. But there was one small problem. There was no crew. The blimp was empty. Let's back up a bit. Earlier that morning of August 16th, 1942, at 6.03 a.m., a United States Navy blimp, L-8, had just lifted off from Treasure Island in San Francisco, headed for the Farallon Islands. Inside the control car were Lieutenant Ernest DeWitt Cody, age 27, and his co-pilot Charles Adams, age 35. It was Adams' first flight as a commissioned officer. L-8 was armed with two depth charges and one 30 caliber machine gun. By this point, the airship had already made 1,092 previous trips without incident and had recently been inspected. It is also of note that the weather conditions that morning were perfectly clear. At 7.38, L-8's crew radioed to Treasure Island and reported observing an oil slick four miles off the coast of the Farallon Islands. Two vessels, a Liberty ship and a fishing boat, both witnessed L-8 descending to within 30 feet of the ocean surface and circling the oil slick. This would constitute the last confirmed sighting of the airship with the crew on board. By 8.50 a.m., the controllers at Treasure Island lost contact with the crew, and shortly after 9 o'clock, L-8 ascended and headed east. Contrary to its intended course towards Point Rise, which was to the northwest. More than two hours later, at around 11.15 a.m., the onlooker sitting on the shore caught sight of L-8, appearing off the coast of Ocean Beach and drifting toward them at low elevation. As the airship crashed down onto the beach, two fishermen tried to hold down L-8 by its tie lines. The fishermen were able to take a glance inside of the control car and observed that no crew were inside, indicating that both Cody and Adams, for unknown reasons, exited the blimp while out at sea. The fishermen eventually were unable to hold the airship down, and it rose briefly into the air before crashing into the hill. As a result of the impact, an automatic valve inside L-8 was opened and began releasing helium gas, causing the airship to take on a sagging, V-shaped appearance. The blimp would continue over the city for several miles before crashing into the aforementioned neighborhood. A search of the coastline from sea, air, and land was conducted, but there was no trace of the missing pilots. Their efforts were abandoned several days later on the 18th of August, with no evidence of the two men. Authorities initially theorized that Cody and Adams had bailed out of the L-8 over the ocean, but this explanation made little sense as all three parachutes were found on board, including a rubber life raft. The airship's radio and engines were still on when it landed in the city, and no distress transmissions had been sent, implying that their exit had been abrupt. An investigative board commissioned by the Navy determined that the blimp had not been shot down, burned, or made any contact with the ocean. Cody and Adams were declared legally dead in 1943. Some speculate that the men were actually spies for Japan and rendezvoused with an I-boat to escape, along with some other sort of dubious theories. Another theory is that one of the men might have slipped out of the aircraft and was dangling from the hatch. It's possible that this caused the other crew member to run over and try and help them, causing the two of them to fall out and into the water. Obviously, though, we'll never know for sure. L-8 currently resides at the Nat- L-8 currently resides at the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida. Japan Airlines Flight 1628 It was just after sunset on the 17th of November, 1986. 
In the skies above eastern Alaska were the crew of a Japan Airlines Boeing 747 cargo flight. The aircraft had departed from Paris and was on its way to Tokyo, Japan. Captain Tirochi, an ex-fighter pilot with more than 10,000 hours of flight experience, was in command. Sitting to his right was co-pilot Tamifuji. Also aboard was flight engineer Sukuda. These three were the only crew members on board. At 5.11 p.m., something catches Captain Tirochi's eye to his left, outside the window. Two aircraft, which he assumed to be military planes, around 2,000 feet below their elevation. According to Tirochi, quote, Suddenly, 600 meters below, I saw what looked like two belts of light. I checked with the Anchorage control tower. They said nothing was showing on their radar. The two aircraft seemed to be following their flight, matching their speed and flight path. It was, quote, like they were toying with us, Tarochi said. They remained to their left for six or seven minutes before abruptly stacking on top of each other and accelerating ahead of the airplane, now positioned in front of them. Then there was a kind of reverse thrust, and the lights became dazzlingly bright. Our cockpit lit up. The thing was flying as if there was no such thing as gravity. The next instant, it changed course. There's no way a jumbo could fly like that. If we tried, it would break apart in midair. The captain then radioed to air traffic control back on the ground to see if they had any flights scheduled to be in front of or around them at that time, which they didn't. ATC asked them to report whether they believed it was a civilian or military aircraft, but Tarochi said that he couldn't tell. All that he could identify were a set of white and yellow strobe lights on the objects. Before long, it seems that the objects simply disappeared from sight before a third one appeared to the crew's left. This time, reportedly, it was... Massive. Much larger than the others. The crew set their onboard radar scope to a 25 nautical mile range, which confirmed that there was, in fact, an object tracing their flight in the expected direction. Co-pilot Tamifuji said, I remember red or orange and white landing lights. He also stated that the power wasn't constant, but that they, quote, became stronger, became weaker, became stronger, became weaker, different from strobe lights. Upon seeing the lights, he first thought he was seeing two small aircraft, but they were very strange because there were too many lights and it was so luminous. After this obviously quite jarring set of events, the crew wanted to get away from whatever it was that was mimicking their flight path. The captain reached back out to ATC, requesting a new heading to try and diverge from the strange aircraft. They approved the request, and the captain initiated the turn. But the objects followed. ATC then advised the captain to make a full 360 degree turn and to report back how the objects reacted. Japan Air 1628 Heavy, sir, does your traffic appear to be staying with you? It uh, disappeared, Japan Air 1628. Japan Air 1628 Heavy, understand you do not see the traffic any longer? Affirmative. After making the turn, it seems that the crew lose visual contact with whatever it was that was following them, and they believed they had gotten away. However, shortly after losing visual contact, ATC was contacted by Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, Alaska. Yeah, this is 1-2 again. On some other equipment here, we have confirmed there is a flight size of 2 around your 1550. One primary return only. 
Okay, where? Is... is he following him? It looks like he is, yes. According to their radar, something was still following the flight. Okay, do you have anybody you can scramble up there? It's starting to concern the Japan airline. It's still following. Yeah, okay. We are calling the military desk on this. ATC then switches back to communicating with the airline. Military radar advises they are picking up intermittent primary target behind you, in trail. Sir, would you like our military to scramble on the traffic? Negative, negative. Due to the captain's knowledge of a similar incident in the 1940s which caused the death of a pilot, he declined the military intervention. Shortly after this exchange, the third object seems to have vanished in the same manner as the first two. Flight 1628 continued on its planned flight to Anchorage, landing safely at 6.20 p.m. Captain Tarochi was later grounded by Japan Airlines for his conversations with the press and was reassigned to a desk job, only allowed to fly again years following the incident. This is indeed a very strange occurrence, However, there are multiple explanations behind what could have caused this. American journalist Philip J. Class stated that astronomical calculations show that on the 17th of November, when the pilot claimed to have seen the object, Jupiter would have been very bright and would have shown right around where the pilot reported seeing the object. Mars would have also been visible just below and to the right of Jupiter, possibly explaining the crew's report of seeing two sets of lights. While this is definitely possible, I'm not sure that this is the correct explanation behind what happened. Captain Tarochi actually drew an image of what the crew saw in the sky that night, and I just don't see how one or two dots in the sky can be mistaken for that. With that being said, I don't really buy the whole UFOs from outer space thing, but my personal guess is that maybe it was some sort of a military vehicle or something, like some sort of undercover project, I don't know. Now, you might think that's where the story ends, but it's not. Fast forward just two months later to January 29th, 1987. 35,000 feet above southwest Alaska at 6.40 p.m., Alaska Airlines Flight 53 observed something seemingly impossible through their onboard weather radar. The radar registered a target in their 12 o'clock position, around 25 miles away. Although they didn't witness anything visually, they noticed that the radar object was increasing its distance at a very high rate. With every sweep of their radar, which occurred around once a second, the object moved an astonishing 5 miles, translating to a speed of 18,000 miles per hour. The object exceeded the 100 mile range of the radar in a matter of seconds. Center 53. Alaska 53, go ahead. Any traffic in this uh, area, do you? Headed towards Anchorage. Uh, I have one coming outbound from Anchorage towards McGrath at this time. Other than that, I don't have any other airplanes. Okay, we're just curious. Up at about our altitude, uh, headed that direction. Thanks. You haven't had any UFO reports lately, huh? Well, I was just getting ready to ask you about that. Uh, could you tell me the position of that aircraft? Yeah, it's just underneath our radar. Picked up a blip, moving about a mile a second. Just pulled out straight ahead of us and disappeared. He was there, then he was gone. Alaska, 53, roger. And, uh, did you have any visual sighting with that aircraft or anything like that? Negative. We just picked up on the radar the, uh, traffic and just watched it. Just pulled out straight ahead of us and just disappeared in a matter of seconds. Now, like me at the time, you might be thinking maybe that was just some sort of a glitch on the radar and it just happened to coincide with whatever the Japan Airlines saw a couple months ago. Seriously, I mean, like, there are so many flights every single day, weird coincidences like that are just bound to happen. But what if I told you there was a third incident? 
the very next day. Above Alaska the following day, on the 30th of January, 1987, was a massive U.S. Air Force KC-135 stratotanker flying from Anchorage to Fairbanks. The pilot reported observing a strange, large object dangerously close to their plane, reportedly just 40 feet away. The object then quickly disappeared from sight. Do you have traffic for us around 1 o'clock? Can't really tell the distance. Seems to be about low altitude. Negative. I have no traffic in your 1 o'clock. We're from California, just visiting up here. People see this sort of thing a lot, apart from the Japan Airline types. Very rare seeing the lights up there. The quality assurance staff at Anchorage Center here request that you give them a call after you land at Elson. That is concerning the object we were looking at? Affirmative, sir. It's anyone's guess as to what these three flights witnessed. JFK's death predicted minutes before. It was November 22nd, 1963. Most Americans who lived through that day are immediately able to recognize its significance. Due to the passage of time, however, less and less of us have memories from that long ago. I am, of course, referring to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The assassination occurred at exactly 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. However, something very strange occurred just 20 minutes earlier. 40 miles west of Los Angeles, in the city of Oxnard, a call was received by General Telephone Company switchboard operator Doris E. Bliss. She originally thought someone had knocked their phone off the hook as she heard no reply when she announced herself as the operator. However, upon hearing the faint sound of whispers coming from the other end of the line, she asked fellow operator Gene M. Shores to join the line as she worried that the caller might have been in some kind of trouble. Whoever was on the line began to dial several different numbers before whispering very finely that, quote, the president is going to die at 1010. Mrs. Bliss and Mrs. Shores then both looked at the telephone company clock on the wall, which, being in California, read 1007 AM. Mrs. Shores stated that the next thing she heard in the same whispering voice was something similar to the following. The justice, the Supreme Court, there is going to be fire in all the windows. The government is going up in flames. Mrs. Shores also stated that the two operators believed the individual on the line was reading from a script because of how quickly she was speaking. The caller then began dialing another string of numbers before Jean again asked if she could be of service. In response, a middle-aged woman calmly replied, Please get off the line, I'm using the phone, matter-of-factly. It seems that she was calling from a party line, which back then meant that the number was shared by several people. It seems that whoever placed the call was unaware that they had the operator on the line. The caller then began reading a list of several different courts before apparently going back on her earlier prediction of the president's death, this time stating, quote, The president is going to die at 10.30. The two operators, believing that the individual on the line was mentally disturbed, disconnected the call after a few minutes of silence. Remarkably, in just a few short minutes, the telephone operators would discover that President Kennedy would be killed at exactly 10.30 Pacific time. 
What makes this even more strange is the fact that JFK's motorcade was scheduled to arrive at 10 o'clock Pacific time, but experienced delays. Now, literally right as this delay was occurring, the caller changed their prediction, which turned out to be correct. There are a few predictions about what could have happened here, but the telephone company was unable to trace back the call, and it's anyone's guess who that could have been. 